okay, let's talk just a little bit. Let maybe we can talk about a specific deal or we can just be broad, but how does selling development sites work in New York? If if a lot of people are listening to this, they're investors, they have capital to spend, but I don't think they fully understand how much work goes into buying a development site, especially in a jurisdiction like New York. So maybe we could start from like day one. You've found a site and maybe a seller that wants to sell. What all happens? Who's involved? What's at risk? Like, let's try and break this down to describe to someone the magnitude of what happens when one of these enormous buildings comes out of the ground. Sure, sure. And it, it is, it, it's complicated, but, um, uh, but, not that complicated. One of the one of the one of the great things about New York zoning um, uh, framework is that we are an as of right jurisdiction, which means that every property is entitled already. Uh, in 1961, the city updated it, its zoning um, resolution, and basically, uh, the zoning resolution tells you three things about every parcel of land in New York City. Uh, it tells you, number one, what type of building you could build there, commercial or residential and, and um, you know, manufacturing, what have you. Um, it tells you uh, it has something called a floor to area ratio, which tells you for every square foot of land, how many square feet of building you could build. So in an FAR of 10, for every one square foot of land, you can build four, the 10 square feet of, of uh, building. So on a, a 10,000 foot lot, you could build a 100,000 foot building. Um, and those FARs range from anywhere from as low as 0 0.2, 0 0.2, up to 33. So there's a very, very wide range. And then the third part, which gets a little bit more complicated, is the contextual aspect of the zoning, meaning what type of setbacks do you have to have from property lines or neighboring properties? What shape can that building have? Um, and there's something referred to as the zoning envelope, which is a, uh, a framework within which you can build, but you can't exceed that envelope. And the best example of that, if you, if you look at some of those uh, office buildings, built on Park Avenue in the 1950s and 60s that kind of look like wedding cakes. Uh, they go up and in and up and in and up and in. That There are actually angles that determine, if you drew a, a line straight up the side of the building and then a line connecting the peaks of all of those setbacks, it creates what's called a sky plane exposure. And so in, in our zoning district, we have these FARs but one of the interesting things is that let's say you have a 10,000 foot parcel of land uh, so you in a 10 FAR district, so you could build 100,000 square feet. Well, the zoning envelope may actually accommodate 180,000 feet of building, but you only, based on your property, you can only um, build 100,000. Well, the city guidelines say that as long as you have at least 10 feet of contiguous property line, you can actually buy air rights from your neighbor. So let's assume that on that 10,000, let's say you have a 10,000 foot parking lot, you're gonna build a 100,000 foot piece of land and next door, your neighbor has a 10,000 foot parcel with a one story building sitting on it, 10,000 square feet, but they also have 100,000 buildable feet Think of air rights as one foot uh, lucite cubes that each one square foot cube and that neighbor has actually 90,000 of those cubes sitting on top of their one story building. And as long as you have 10 feet of contiguous property line with that neighbor, you can actually buy their cubes and stick them on top of your building. So in this case where you have 100,000 buildable feet as of right, and your envelope can hold 180,000 feet. You couldn't buy 90,000 feet from your neighbor, but you could buy 80,000 feet from your neighbor. And in some juris some zoning jurisdictions, some districts, you have unlimited height. So that's why you see these buildings that are 100 stories on, on you know Central Park South, 
that don't have a height restriction to them. So if you were able to buy up air from contiguous properties, because if you, it, and I hope I'm not getting too granular oh, here. But I love it. You, 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 let's say you, you bought the air rights from your neighbor, then that enables you to buy air rights from their neighbor oh. and their neighbor and their neighbors. You can go all the way down the street as long as you have a contiguous chain of these air rights that you're buying. So, you know, there are some sites where maybe your as of right zoning would allow you to build 100,000 feet where there's a 500,000 foot building because you've also not only have you bought air rights, but there are bonus programs you can take advantage of by buying you know, um, if somebody creates an affordable housing building somewhere, they have these transferable rights that they can get. And then there are, are other programs within the city if you're in a certain district, like if you're within the theater district, in order to preserve uh, the the old landmark th theaters in the theater district in New York, those theater owners can sell their air rights not only to somebody next door to them, but anywhere within the theater district. So they're they're very transferable, and that that is a dynamic that in, exists in other areas of the city also. But we're, we're getting very very granular with zoning. But look, so let's say the the owner of that ten thousand foot lot comes to me, Bob. I want to sell. First thing we're going to do is look at opportunities to expand the site. Does the site qualify for any bonuses? How do you acquire those bonuses? What do you have to pay for those bonuses? Are there air rights from neighboring properties that can be purchased or are there neighboring properties that could be purchased? Maybe that one story uh, building sitting on the parcel next door, maybe that owner wants to sell to take advantage of the, uh, the massive amount of building rights they have. You try to increase the size of the site as much as you can because there are a lot of parcels in the city that are in high density zoning districts that are only 20 by 100 or 25 by 100. That's the a very standard lot size uh, in New York. So, you know, you typically like to build on at least 10,000 feet of land, if not 20,000 feet of land. Um, and those are very, very hard to find. So often you have to assemble a bunch of smaller properties to create a site that's large enough. But you look at all of those possibilities, then we we tell the owner what the their property's worth, uh, and then before bringing the, the site out to market, we want to do a couple of other things. One, um, we want to have an environmental report done to see if there are any adverse environmental conditions on that property. Were there oil tanks that leaked? Uh, was there uh, some kind of um, adverse condition with asbestos or or something? Often there are there are uh, issues that properties have to deal with from an environmental perspective. And then this, this aspect of the contextual zoning where you have this envelope and sky plane exposures and everything, it's extraordinarily difficult to figure that out. So we, we, have, uh, we often encourage uh, owners to hire someone to do a formal massing study to understand what you can and can't do what setbacks you have to have, how much can you build, how many, what's the maximum potential that a, a site has. And so you need to do a lot of homework uh, with respect to that kind of thing to know what it is that you're selling. Uh, and then we also have tenants to deal with. We have, um, you know, often there, there are tenants that have, they're protected by rent regulation that need to be bought out. I just sold a, a 13,000 foot development site on the Upper East Side that had two rent stabilized tenants in the corner property of, this was four properties that made up this site. One property had two rent stabilized tenants in it and the developer ended up paying them $10 million to leave. So it, it's, there are a number of moving parts with these things, but they're kind of fun. Uh, they are uh, brain teasers. You have to make sure that you address all of these different issues or you can waste a lot of time uh, as a broker, but it all comes down to knowing what it is that you're selling.